My name is Chrissy Collette and um, I feel like I'm part of the furniture in this place because I was one of the foundation weavers um, starting here in 1976 and I worked here for 15 years and I've been fortunate enough to, um, to keep a relationship going with the Tapestry Workshop. Um, Thank you very much for coming. It's just very heartening to see so many people here. And uh, I hope that I can interest you in what I'm speaking about. But before I, I start, I would like to thank Antonia um, Simon, the director, and Adrienne Haywood, who has put this together and allowed me to bring this talk to you tonight. So thank, I want to thank you very much. Okay, so do come in, Tuppy. <laughs> um, this talk should go for about an hour, um, and I thought instead of having uh, questions at the end, um, it would be much more productive if you did ask me things as we went along, uh, especially when um, you see a slide and you're curious about something. Um, just yell out because I'm going to be wearing my reading glasses so I won't be able to see raised hands. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here we go. So, um, I designed this tour in 2011. I have been teaching for 11 years at RMIT uh, in the Studio Textiles and Design course where I, do I taught drawing and tapestry all day. And um, in their wisdom, at the end of 2010, they decided to cut my subject out of the course and make me redundant. So, in a way, I designed this tour. I've actually been overseas in 2009 uh, to Europe and to most of these places. And I thought, well, I would love to do this as an extension of my teaching, the knowledge that I've built up over so many years that I could impart to other people. And I designed it so that um, it was a balance between uh, looking at medieval and classical tapestry in a historical context and visiting contemporary studio artists, most of whom were trained um, through the Anthropology Guard, just to see um, the two ends of the spectrum. So. This is really what this tour is about, and I've been fortunate now to do it three times, and this year there's an impending one in September, although it's far from fully booked or um, confirmed. So, um, we start the tour in London, and uh, at the Victoria and Albert Museum, and this is uh, a picture of the courtyard there, and uh, most of you will know that it's in South Kensington, and it houses the most superb collection of decorative arts and some major tapestries. Um, what I love about the VNA is that you do get a little contemporary blast as you go in as well. Um, so this is uh, the gorgeous foyer area and you can see um, a very uh, medieval uh, wood uh, carving at the back there on the balcony but in the foreground there's the foyer pendant which is designed by Dale Chihuly who actually did a residency here at ANU not so long ago so there's this fabulous combination of old and new it's very um, exciting uh, glass pendant. But the reason for starting at the DNA is that uh, about four years ago they opened the new uh, medieval and renaissance galleries. And by starting at this point you can actually go through um, and have a look at the history of tapestry and see examples of um, you know, this practice and where it started and how it fits into that medieval herb. 
So we start with a beautiful collection of Coptic fragments, uh, of which this is one. And I'm sure that most of you know about weaving, and you know about the whole process because you've been in touch with the Tapestry Workshop hopefully for many years. So you will understand it when I say that this is one of the first examples of tapestry weaving as we know it. Um, and the Coptic work developed uh, from the 1st to the 11th centuries and alongside it, alongside the uh, Peruvian tapestry, they're the, they're the earliest examples of tapestry that we find. Um, these fragments were preserved in the hot sandy deserts of Egypt and that's why we're very fortunate to have them now and for them to be in all the textile museum collections in the world. You can see actually that um, this, this tunic medallion, which would be about, oh, about six to ten inches in size, is highly detailed and highly decorative, and they were developed um, as uh, decoration for tunics. Uh, in some cases, they were woven and stitched onto the tunics, which was a very simple uh, tunic structure. In other cases, um, uh, as with bands, they were um, actually woven into the warp, um, a plain weave and then a decorative um, band or medallion actually woven into the garment. So this, um, this panel is uh, a naive uh, tapestry, uh, probably woven in Germany. It, it dates from 1490 and is believed to be woven by nuns. And this is just a section of it. Um, I do tend to show a lot of detail so that you can actually see the weaving rather than the whole thing which just you know, falls back and looks like a picture. Um, and you can see the ribbons of text um, and that indicates to us that it is a story. And in fact, it is a story. Um, it's the story of a woman's um, spiritual journey from fashionable lady to novice nun. And even though uh, there was very sophisticated weaving going on at this time, as you can see with the, with the next slide, this wasn't woven by professional weavers. This was woven by um, nuns and, you know, there was a lot of weaving going on. Uh, in the community, and it has that very um, raw sort of quality to it, but nevertheless a lot of charm. So there are several examples of tapestry in the medieval Renaissance gallery, and then the gallery actually um, ends in this beautiful tapestry, the Boar and Bear Hunt, and here you can see the sophistication. This actually um, was woven earlier than the previous one. Um, the Chatsworth Hunts, or the Devonshire Hunting Tapestries as they're called, were woven in Arras or Tournay by, by professional weavers, I don't know which, which workshop they came from, uh, between 1430 and 1450. And this one is called the Boar and Bear Hunt. So the gallery actually culminates in this very spectacular piece. And there are three other pieces in the suite, falconry, uh, swan and otter hunt, and the deer hunt, uh, which are housed upstairs in the V&A Tapestry Gallery. Um, it's interesting because uh, the curators have actually over the years uh, being able to date the tapestries exactly um, through features of the costume. And uh, here I've got a little detail of the deer hunt on the left and on the right hand side 
the detail of the, the weaving of the ermine of the robes. So fashion has played a very important part in our appreciation of this work. Um, the whole the whole suite is about 133 feet in length, and even though it has they have lost a few inches at the top and the bottom through renovation, you do see this magnificent spread of tapestry, which is quite mind-boggling in in detail and uh, composition and uh, skill of weaving. Now the other thing that I have at the DNA is a, a room full of a huge hall, in fact, a huge hall full of um, Raphael cartoons. And these cartoons, uh, which were designed for tapestries, were commissioned by Pope Leo X in 1515. And they're entitled The Acts of the Apostles. And they were woven to decorate the side walls of the Sistine Chapel. So the, these tapestries were woven at that time uh, in a workshop uh, which was headed by Peter Van Elst in Brussels. And in fact, it led to a huge change in what people started to weave and how weavers approached their work. Um, because of the detail, the complexity of the design, and because the cartoons that the weavers were given were painted by Raphael with, with such skill, uh, the interpretative skills of the weavers were really tested, and what they, what they started to do was actually just copy the painting. So all of a sudden, um, the charm, which you saw in the previous tapestries, um, and uh, the sort of flat picture plane and the decorative qualities of weaving, which we now find very intrinsic, were subsumed uh, and the tapestries just became copies of paintings. So uh, the weavers succumbed to the domination of Renaissance painting. And here I've got a couple of examples um, these weren't the, the early versions, but because these cartoons, this one's called The Miraculous Draft of Fishes, and of course it illustrates the uh, Christ drawing uh, the fish out of the, the water to feed um, the how many thousand it was, I can't remember. But um, because of the popularity of these designs, they were woven over and over again. And these two uh, tapestries were actually woven uh, in a workshop called the Mortlake Workshop, which was established in West London by James I in 1619. And to do this, he actually imported Flemish weavers to, to weave there. And Charles I bought the Raphael cartoons for reproduction when he was Prince of Wales. And his coat of arms and regalia is included in the tapestry border in the right hand one. So what we have here is one tapestry woven in 1623, another tapestry woven in 1636, and you can see that um, the interpretations are quite different in terms of colour, and the main thing that's happened here is that an artificial frame has been added to the subject matter, once again, sort of paying homage to the tapestry as a painting rather than a tapestry. Okay, a couple of years ago, um, we went to Hampton Court Palace, and uh, you would be familiar with this. It's a bit south of London, and of course, was the home of Henry VIII. Um, the palace was built in the Tudor style by, and developed by Cardinal Wolsey from 1514. And uh, then it was added to in the Baroque style by Christopher Wren, who transformed uh, part of it in the late 1600s for William and Mary. So um, 
Hampton Court Palace is very important in that it has uh, a conservation studio attached to it, and unfortunately we haven't been able to see that due to pressure of work. Um, but we've had very interesting guided tours of uh, the palace and the tapestries. And I suppose the, the main suite of tapestries is this one, from which there are a couple of details, and it's called The Story of Abraham. And it was commissioned by Henry VIII. Uh, ten, a suite of ten tapestries uh, completed in Brussels around 1543. And they depict scenes of the life of the prophet Abraham, drawn from Genesis chapters 12 to 24. Um, it's estimated that, um, in fact, uh, Henry VIII had a collection of about 2,000 tapestries, and um, they were actually currency. They were like money in the bank. And they were, at that time, um, used to um, designate his, his power. Tapestries were used as um, a great display of wealth and power and to send political messages to his enemies around Europe. Um, even a hundred years after Henry's death, the Abraham suite alone was valued at over £8,000. So you can imagine um, in those days what enormous sums of money those were to pay for these tapestries. Um, they used a lot of silk and gilt metal wrap threads and um, for many years these tapestries were used um, in, as, as the backdrop for coronations in Westminster Abbey and they were often paraded through the streets in processions once again to show off wealth and power. Now I have put in um, a few slides not just of tapestries but um, environmental slides I suppose just to uh, give you a feeling of what we do look at and I had hundreds to choose from it was very hard to pair it back but this is a lovely Tudor garden which of course is part of the palace area and uh, we were lucky to see it in full bloom. So a different sort of castle here. This is actually the West Dean College of the Arts and it's set in um, gorgeous sort of six and a half acres in West Sussex uh, in the South Downs. Um, and it's part of what's called the Edward James Foundation. So this is Edward James's castle. It's made of Norfolk flint and it was originally made in 1622 and it was renovated again in 1805 and 1892. And in 1964, um, well, I should say, Edward James inherited a lot of wealth and he was a great patron of the arts and interestingly enough, he was very interested in surrealist art, so he has a great collection of that. But he turned this into a school of arts and crafts and uh, every year over 700 short courses are run at the, at um, in this property, and um, they also have MA and diploma courses. Just a, they also have um, they have many types of crafts, and they also have horticulture. This is just a rather charming um, view of the gardens and the dovecot. Yes. Okay, so the other very important thing that happens down there at West Dean is that there is the West Dean Tapestry Studio. And this was started in 1976, the same year as the Tapestry Workshop started here. And their very first commission was to weave uh, eight tapestries um, designed by Henry Moore, so probably recognise the design style and when we were there last year uh, there was a drawing and a tapestry sample hanging there on, you can see on the left hand side so 
this was a big commission and these eight tapestries were woven to hang at the Henry Moore Foundation. I was very lucky to see them in 1980 at display at the VNA. And since this relationship started with with Henry Moore, who has now passed away, but it's his daughter Mary who who um, uh, went on commissioning the tapestries. Um, they've now woven 23 works. So originally they were woven on a low wall horizontal loom, which you can see there, and the studio was run and established by a woman called. Marie Louise Svensson, who was, um, I think, from Sweden. And um, this um, commission got them underway. That was their, you know, their formative sort of commission. And on the right hand side, I've just put in uh, one of his mother and child tapestries. You can see very true to his, his uh, beautiful, enigmatic sort of drawings. And Last year we also visited um, the Henry Moore Foundation, which is at a place called Perry Green, and we visited his lovely house called Hoglands, and this vast property in which the Ald Barn sits and the ten tapestries that were commissioned originally for the Ald Barn. Unfortunately, uh, no photography was allowed, so I have to content myself with this to show you. Okay, the other thing that I saw on the loom in 2009 at the West End Studio was um, the beginning of this extraordinary, or it was probably halfway through this extraordinary project, which some of you might know about, and that was the reweaving of the Hunt of the Unicorn suite of tapestries, a 15th century suite. Uh, the originals of which are housed in the cloisters in New York. And they were commissioned by Historic Scotland, which is uh, Scotland's version of the National Trust, and funded by an American foundation, a private foundation called the Chequa Foundation, to reweave the whole suite of tapestries. Uh, and they're now hanging in the Queen's rooms at St James's Palace at Stirling Castle. So uh, it's a very, very interesting project, but I will talk more about it when I show you the Stirling Castle slides. But the project here has taken them 13 years to complete, so quite an amazing uh, achievement, really. And. Um, I, a few Australian weavers have gone over to, to work on them. Uh, Joy Smith, who some of you might know. Um, and I think it's a fascinating exercise in, you know, a contemporary weaver getting into the mind of a medieval weaver and, um, and performing that task. Last year when we went to West End, we also went to Chichester Cathedral. And here, um, this is the stained glass window that the, that the cathedral is famed for. It dates from 1978 and it was designed by Chagall. And the subject matter is the story of the 12 tribes of Israel. Also in the cathedral, there is a tapestry behind the altar designed by John Piper. And this was woven at Panton Frere in Felletin, which is also a place we visit on the tour in 1966. Uh, three central panels symbolise the Trinity and the four outer panels the elements. Um, it's very much that uh, 19, you know, 50s, 60s style of, um, of uh, painting. And Directly behind it, uh, there is a tapestry. This really literally hangs right behind it, a uh, tapestry by Ursula Banker Schirmer, which was commissioned in 18, 19, sorry, 1984. And one of the purposes was to strengthen 
Anglo-German relations after the, you know, the terrible uh, feeling of the war to get over that. Uh, it's quite a spectacular piece, um, and it includes the chalice of St. Richard, the candle symbolising the light of the world and reconciliation, and the fig tree, fruitfulness, and the fish symbolising Christ. Now, a studio visit in London with William Jeffries, who is a graduate of the Edinburgh College of Art. And um, this is uh, his studio in 2011. And uh, his work is really very interesting. I'll show you some details here. Um, these are small pieces, and as you can see, um, they really owe a lot to embroidery as well as tapestry. They are woven, but he does manipulate the edges uh, through using wire and couching, and uh, he uses um, uh, transparent fishing line, sizal, uh, uh, a variety of materials to do these very sort of individual dynamic sort of works. And this is a larger piece, and you can see that he's used a lot of uh, sizal in it and a lot of texture, uh, texture with sumac knots. But the, the main feature of this is that he's actually um, manipulated the top and bottom so that it hangs in this sort of concertina fold, which is very interesting. It's a largish wall pattern. And our other studio artist that we visit, who's just out of London in Hertfordshire, is Anna Ray. And Anna graduated, she's a more recent graduate of Edinburgh College of Art, and she does this very exciting work. Some of you might have seen this image already. It's called Not Now, and it's um, a constructed piece. Uh, all those of um, threaded together to form this incredibly vibrant piece of work. And this is Anna in the studio a couple of years ago. And you can see on the back wall similar pieces of this sort of stuffed um, material. And interestingly enough, what she has there on the table, um, a series of embroideries, white on white, which are absolutely exquisite and almost the, the opposite extreme of those big sort of um, uh, rugged forms that she creates uh, with the wall pieces. And these are all done in satin stitch, really absolutely delicate, gorgeous work. Now, what I tend to do with the tour is alternate each year we either go to Edinburgh or Exeter and last year we went to Exeter, and this is the Cathedral Church of St. Peter. And we had, we were fortunate enough to have a guided tour with the head of the Tapissiers and accompanied by a weaver called Pat Johns, who designed an altar cloth. She's a very established weaver, and she designed an altar cloth for the cathedral. Um, I'm just showing you some of the kneelers. Um, they have um, embroidered 500 of these exquisite things. And of course the, the church is very old and uh, a lot of it is bare stone. So these lovely kneelers sort of brighten up every corner. Um, so they were proposed in 1969 and they are embroidered by volunteers right through uh, Devon and coordinated by the head of the TPCS. And then artist studios. This is Julie Edwards with a new tapestry of hers. You may have seen a small piece of hers in the Cape Durham Award last year, uh, similar to this in design. Um, and it's from this uh, travel series called Wanderlust, which is actually currently being exhibited at the Saatchi Gallery in London, the whole lot. So that's a great achievement for Jilly. 
a very warm and hospitable person. And uh, she explained that this series arose from, most of her work uh, comes out of travel. And uh, she was crisscrossing Britain at one stage and looking at the canola fields, which they call red seed. So this bright yellow sort of proposed itself to her, which she uses in, in this series, sequence of tapestries. And she even went so far as to dye her hair yellow to go with <laughs> So on the left hand side, I don't know if you can see this very clearly, but it's um, a very interesting way of weaving. Um, it's it's Anne, Anne Jackson's loom, also in Exeter. And what she does is she weaves upside down. And uh, the, the weaving is sort of, as you can see, pinned at the top. And she has all the warp threads hanging down. And then she goes along with a sumac knot uh, so that every warp thread is worked around and around. And she builds it from the top down. And you can see her design there in the background. So that's quite fascinating. And next to it, I've put a detailed series that she wove in the early 2000s dealing with uh, the witches of Exeter, the last witch of, witches that, who were um, hanged in Exeter. And of course you can see um, a great influence from these medieval manuscripts there. And the third artist that we visit in Exeter is Christine Sawyer. And one of the interesting things that I found with those weavers is that they all do very small maquettes before they plunge into large work. And um, this isn't a maquette, this is a full-size tapestry, but they always say that when they have exhibitions, they sell all the maquettes. So for commercial reasons, it's very, very profitable. But Christine's work is to do with the environment and the way we treat the environment. And this is a particularly beautiful tapestry, I think. It's called Yesterday's Must Haves, and it was woven in 2011. So this big coil of thrown away material, um, the full tapestry on the left, and a detail of the weaving on the right. And uh, last year we also were able to go to Coat Hill House, which is actually in Cornwall. It's not far from um, Exeter um, and it's a Tudor manor which is sort of deep in the Cornish uh, um, countryside and it was established by Richard Edgecombe, sorry, Ed, and yet it was in the Edgecombe family from the 1400s. It was one of uh, England's first show houses and the fascinating thing about this is that it's literally upholstered in tapestry and embroidery and I can't really give you a feeling for what it looks like on the inside but believe me, every single wall and um, uh, furniture is just covered mostly in 17th century textiles <coughs> and uh, this is a little example of of uh, a weaving and you can see that it's all kind of patched and, and put together it goes around windows and doors and uh, you know in every single chamber of, of, of the manor uh, there's no electricity there and so it's very hard to photograph inside you can't you're not allowed to use flashes you're not allowed in lots of uh, public galleries but that might just give you a bit of a feeling <laughs> So, Edinburgh. We were in Edinburgh in 2012 and we were lucky enough to stay in the Apex Hotel which has actually this view um, of the grass market with uh, the castle up on the hill. And um, I was very fortunate to study there in 1980 at the Edinburgh College of Art and I made friends whom I still have today. And um, of course, 
our connection to Edinburgh is very much through Archie Brennan, who oversaw the establishment of this workshop here. He was a director of the Dalcott Studios in the 1960s and 1970s and revolutionised the way we weave tapestry um, and brought all his knowledge here uh, to establish this workshop. So the Dalcott Studios was originally in a dusty old building in Kostorfen, but a few years ago uh, they had financial difficulties and in fact they were saved by a private benefactor called Alastair Salveson and um, the workshop was moved to this beautiful building. I've always thought I was the most beautiful workshop in the world but this actually quite rivals it and um, and this was the old Edinburgh bar, so it's right in the centre of Edinburgh. And the floor of the workshop, it was the, the original swimming pool. So you can see all that lovely structure and the beautiful mezzanine. And we were there in 2012 to see um, Weaving the Century, which was the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the Dark Rock Studios in 1912 by the Marcus, Marcus of Butte and they had a spectacular exhibition of the tapestries through the ages. Um, the older tapestries were housed in galleries alongside but you can see some of the newer works there um, on the mezzanine area. And one of the interesting things was that there's a little slide of the large tree group when it was started, uh, designed by Victoria Crow. And of course, if you'd like to learn more about it, there's a very good exhibition in the front foyer that tells you all about this tapestry that was chosen to be woven as a commemor commemorative piece for the 100th anniversary. So, Edinburgh artists, now because of uh, the Edinburgh College of Art, um, a lot of uh, tapestry weavers are based in Edinburgh and uh, they have their own practice. Um, they get commissions and they exhibit their work. And uh, this is one of them, Linda Green. And um, I've always uh, thought her work was really very interesting because uh, I'll show you in the next slide, she tends to work um, with texture and uh, here she's actually showing us some drawings. She did uh, a residence at um, uh, the Neil Garden at Duddingston Lock and she started uh, looking at Phragmites, a sort of reed and uh, weaving with the reed, drying, splitting and weaving the reed um, into small uh, tapestries and uh, also got her inspiration through looking at the reed through the microscope and it eventuated in an exhibition at the Edinburgh Botanical Gardens called From Straw to Gold, which if you know the Rumpel and Stiltskin story is a, a lovely apt title. This is one of her earlier works and um, it's called Connection. It was woven in 2009 and she builds the work. Um, this, is a, this is worked with, uh, with wire and um, other sort of found twisted pieces of material and she builds them on little um, plastic um, Trays, I suppose, uh, with, uh, that she weaves in and out of. So it's very much like a drawing, and um, it's a textile, but it's a drawing, which is interesting. Then at Wasp Studios, we visit um, Joe Barker on the left and Fiona Hutchison, both of whom are weavers whose work I really admire, and they're doing uh, interesting experimental things. Um, the Wasp Studios is an old bakery that's 
converted into a gallery and artist studio. So it's a fascinating place in itself, also in the heart of Edinburgh. And um, uh, they both have studio spaces there. So uh, I'll talk about Joe with the next slide, but on the right there's um, Fiona Hutchison, whose work is about the sea. She's a sailor. She does a lot of um, experimental three-dimensional work. And um, she talked about how um, you know she arrives at this work which reflects moving water. She's she's really inspired by the colours and the textures and the way life reflects off water, and that's her her main thrust with her work. And this is a piece by Joe Barker, which was woven in two thousand and eight. And her tapestries are very, very subtle, uh, tremendous sort of saturation of colour. She uses drawing and collage, and she's very particular about uh, the wool that she uses to weave them to get that particular sort of saturation. And they're very large, very dramatic, and she's had a lot of public commissions. So, from Edinburgh to Stirling, and um, this is Stirling Castle, which, as I said before, was built by James V. It was built for his French bride, Marie de Guise, and it was completed in 1545. And this is actually where Mary's Queen of Scots grew up. Um, uh, James uh, died when, when Mary's Queen of Scots was only five years old. And this is where the Hunt of the Unicorn Tapestries, the reworked Hunt of the Unicorn Tapestries, are now housed. Um, so Marie de Guise lived on in her palace um, for quite a long time, and I will show you the renovated um, pictures. Okay, so um, when these tapestries were rewoven, they had a studio, as I said, at West Dean, and then they established another purpose-built studio at Stirling Castle. And the one at West Dean was what we call low warp, or horizontal technique, and here you can see this is high warp, like the tapestries we weave here. The tapestries were woven to be about a tenth smaller than the original, so so not um, not tremendous, you know, not a not a huge reduction, and they were woven at ten warps to the inch, as opposed to the eighteen to twenty warps to the inch of the original tapestries. And here you see. Um, the tapestry on the loom, the cartoon behind, and a detail of the weaving. I think this is the fourth tapestry in the series. There are six, and this is the fourth one. And these are some beautiful details. So these tapestries fall into that category of 15th century tapestry, which is called Mille Fleur, or a thousand flowers. So you can see how highly detailed the backgrounds are and how beautifully worked they are. So this is um, an installation of the tapestries. All the, they're, they were all installed except for the last one. And those are the Queen's apartments in St James's Palace. And you can see that they've restored it to the original uh, with this very bright stenciling, which unfortunately, I think, um, subdues the impact of the tapestries. And you can see that the tapestries are hung from the ceiling and um, that they reach down to the doorway. There's a doorway there on the right-hand side with somebody going through. Uh, but I was actually very sad to see that um, there was uh, a velvet panel above the bed which cuts out 
um, sections of those two tapestries behind and I couldn't help but feel very sorry for the weavers who'd spent, you know, days and days of labour in uh, weaving those sections that are not even to be viewed. But they wanted to make this as authentic as possible. So um, this is uh, one of the, I think it's number two in the series, the unicorn dips his horn into the stream to rid it of poison. Excuse me, can I ask, have they been rewoven because the originals are in such bad repair? No, the originals um, belong in New York and they're at the cloisters. So they were trying to find a, cont a contemporaneous suite of tapestries that they could weave, especially for this project. And um, the, the ones in New York are in relatively good condition. And uh, if you ever go there, it's really worth seeing. So Paris is our next stop. So from one wonderful suite of tapestries to another, this is the conciergerie as you cross the Pont, Pont Neuf to um, go across to the Musée du Moyen Âge. Um, and this is the Musée du Moyen Âge. So um, this is uh, a really fantastic uh, museum. And if you don't know about tapestry and medieval art, a lot of people you know, don't even find this museum. And uh, it was, the, the structure itself um, dates from Gallo-Roman times. And then on top of it was built this 15th century Hotel de Cluny. And it was home to um, a collector called Alexandre de Somerville from 1833 to 1842. And he assembled a huge collection of medieval art, um, uh, all sorts of, of art, uh, sculpture and ceramics and uh, gilt and tapestries, of course, and beautiful woodwork. And uh, on the right hand side, we see a 16th century tapestry called um, Amorous Couples. And, of course, the highlight is the Lady in the Unicorn, um, woven in Brussels in the, 15th, in the 1500s. So, I'm sure most of you know about these tapestries because um, they are so famous and the imagery is, is, has been used so much around the world in all sorts of commercial ways as well, but to actually see them is quite a, a breathtaking experience. And uh, they do have, or they have had, a very beautiful oval room that the tapestries are exhibited in. But they are, at the moment, doing renovations and uh, they will be housed differently and the entrance to the Musée de Moyen-Arche is going to be changed. So it will be very interesting to see them. I think uh, the middle of the year, the new exhibit is opening. And uh, the tapestries <coughs> are supposed to have been woven as a wedding gift for the family of Jean Leviste in the 1500s. And uh, each of them deals with one of the senses, one of the five senses, sight, hearing, taste, smell, touch, and another entitled Amonso de Sia. And this one that I've got here is Taste, with the lady helping herself to a bowl of sweets. Um, these tapestries were recovered and, uh, by Prosper Mary May, an author, and George Sand in the 1840s. Originally, they were housed in this castle in Busa, and uh, they were found in in very bad condition and fortunately they were saved and given to the Musée du Moyen Âge. Um, just another couple of exhibits. This is an early hunting tapestry, um, probably woven in Strasbourg. Um, 
And it's, uh, it's once again one of those naive tapestries from the late 15th century. This is the chapel, beautiful chapel in the Museum de Moinage. And these are some of the recovered artefacts. Um, a lot of the artefacts that are housed there came from when um, the banks of the Seine were being dug up for building purposes and uh, these uh, things were recovered and housed and protected in the museum. And of course when we're in Paris we do have lunch, which is always very nice. Um, the next uh, workshop we visit is the Gobelin Tapestry Workshop, um, which is the most important, they say the most important, but it's certainly the most long-running workshop in the world, and it's situated in the 13th arrondissement on the left bank of the Seine. And uh, this workshop was um, established in the mid-15th century by Jean Gobelin and purchased in 1662 by the XIV. And here he made, you know, once again this um, idea of wealth and power and ownership. This was his own tapestry manufactory uh, which would, you know, fur furnish all the tapestries for his grand palaces. This is the courtyard and uh, there is a little statue of um, Colbert, his minister, who administered the workshops. This is a slide of the exhibition hall, which is alongside the manufactory, and they always have rather fabulous exhibitions. It's an enormous hall, and these are a couple of details from Renaissance tapestries that were hanging there um, in 2011. Um, last year they had uh, an exhibition of quite contemporary work. Also, once again, very hard to photograph because you're not allowed to use flash. And then in the tour of the Gobelin, you are actually strictly not allowed to take any photographs inside the buildings. But I've got a couple of sneaky ones. And um, this was taken in 2011, and it's a Vassarelli rug. Now what's happened with the Gobelin is that it uh, is administered by the government, it's fully funded by the government, and it weaves rugs and tapestries to hang in the public buildings. So uh, it really doesn't have to fight for funds in any way. And, um, uh, Vassarelli was a, a, a very popular pop artist in the 60s and 70s and um, this tapestry, this rug is two-dimensional in case you were wondering. And this is a photograph of the tapestry that I took last year. It took about five or six years to make. Um, it's not all that large, uh, it's about I don't know, eight feet by four feet. Um, very interesting design. We weren't told who the designer was, but it, it took, um, as I said, five or six years to, to, to weave. And the weavers who work at the Gobelin uh, weave about one square metre a year. So, extraordinary. <laughs> And this is a detail which I found fascinating, um, uh, which is built up with half passing, but you know you can see that's the, it's a, it really does look like a, an amazing jumper, but um, a great feat, but uh, very slow. Part of the problem is, of course, that a lot of the tapestries, well, all the tapestries are woven from the back, and a lot of them are woven horizontally, which makes it, you know. Uh, a very difficult proposition and a very slow proposition. In Paris we also uh, visit the Musée des Arts Décoratifs, which um, ha houses a fantastic array of decorative arts from medieval to modern. 
And uh, I'll just show you a couple of the more contemporary examples because we have been looking at so many medieval tapestries. This is a beautiful Art Deco stained glass panel um, designed by Jacques Goubert in 1930. And it celebrates the invention of tubular steel as a building material. So here we have a beautiful decorative piece celebrating the Centre of Decorative Arts is all about. And um, this is actually the apartment of the fashion designer Jean Lanvin. And uh, the apartment was commissioned to be decorated in 1924. And it's quite exquisite. This is uh, apparently Lanvin blue. And the hangings are exquisitely machine embroidered um, with uh, motifs of white palms, roses and marguerites. And when her apartment building was demolished in 1965, the whole four-room suite was moved, relocated and recreated in the Museo des Art Decorative. Um, so, uh, from Paris we go to Angers, which is a gorgeous medieval town. I'm rushing a little bit now because um, I, can, I can see that we're coming up to time. But um, if anyone feels that they have to go, please feel free to do that. Um, so Angers is um, uh, west of Paris and it's in the Loire Valley. And uh, on the left-hand side is just a street scene with, with, with a wonderful accumulation of, of um, uh, Tudor buildings. And on the right-hand side is the cathedral, um, which houses some very important tapestries. Every time we go in there, it has a huge collection. And every time we go in there, um, there's a different suite on view. Once again, I'm sorry, no internal pictures of these medieval tapestries. Um, this is the view from the cathedral down into the town. And this, in fact, is the main reason why we go to Angers, or one of the two main reasons we go to Angers. And um, this is the castle that dates from Neolithic times. It's right on the edge of the town, sort of perched on the river and um, is quite spectacular. And that's just a detail of the plantings that they put in the moat, as you can see there. And every year you get different uh, flower arrangements and different flowers. So um, the important thing about the chateau is that it houses the Apocalypse Tapestry, which is 100 metres long. It's the oldest surviving suite of tapestries that we have in the world. And it was woven in the 14th century. And it was woven um, by a studio headed by Nicola de Bataille. And it's supposed to have been woven between 1373 and 1380, which is only seven years, which seems like an amazing feat. Um, they were designed by the court painter Jean Bandol from manuscripts owned by Charles V of France. And there are 71 surviving scenes in seven panels, measuring 80 feet long by 20 feet high. Um, they were woven during the Hundred Years' War between England and France. And um, it is really the apocalyptic vision of St. John uh, made visible uh, and uh, illustrates the whole book of Revelations in this very uh, beautiful medieval style, which I think appeals very much to us today because um, of the sort of flat picture plane. Um, it, it really has a sort of resonance Also in um, Angers, a little swift walk over the river brings you to St John's Hospital, which is a, a, a 
an architectural agglomeration of 12th century buildings. And here we find um, Jean Le Sars, uh, Jean du Monde, which is his answer to the apocalypse tapestries. Uh, he uh, worked in the 1930s and 40s, and in fact, um, the popularity of tapestries has always been cyclical, and he resurrected uh, the popularity of tapestries. He commissioned his work through Aubusson and he reinvigorated the whole weaving community in the 1950s. <clears throat> and he, what had happened to tapestry was that it became extremely decorative and was used to decorate boudoirs and, you know, was very complex in design, you know, furnishing fabrics and so on. And he just brought it back from um, using 200 shades of colour to just 45 and um, eliminating perspective. Here you can see him working on his cartoons and numbering them and a couple of details from the Song of the World. And, and he also introduced a much coarser texture so that a tapestry looked like a tapestry rather than a painting. So bringing it back uh, to its um, former glory. Um, it's just an amusing uh, slide that somebody, some of us might know. Uh, my friend the weaver Jennifer Sharp who was uh, imitating medieval made in a well. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> and this well is actually behind that beautiful building where there is the cloister which you see on the right hand side. Yeah. So from there we drive down to a beautiful week in the country. So this is the view of the manoir that we stay in as we enter. It's about a five hour drive from Angers to Bourguignon. And the reason we stay in Bergenhof is that it's a sort of stone's throw, 40 minute um, bus ride to Aubusson, which is the last um, part of the journey for us. And um, this is a beautiful 250 year old manor house. Um, it's the back view, which is rather gorgeous. And it's full of um, furniture that dates from uh, Louis XVI and also some Renaissance furniture and it's also stuff full of old Aubusson tapestries. Um, so it's a very appropriate place to stay and while we stay there I actually teach a workshop so that's the workshop in progress in the dining room. But it's also lovely to you know have that uh, a week after you've been travelling for two weeks and seeing and doing something that fills every single day, you can actually relax for a week. When you're not weaving, you can do Tai Chi by the pool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the last part is our, t our two visits to Aubusson and Felatin. So we stay at the Manoir for a week. We do a workshop for four days of that week and we have um, two visits, uh, two days of visits to Aubusson. So this town is very unique in that it's survived on tapestry since the 14th century. Um, the last decade has been quite tough because it's a town full of weavers who weave in their own atelier and what has happened I suppose is um, the, the normal sort of attrition where um, this craft has been handed down from parent to child and the younger generation is um, not interested in staying in this beautiful little town and, and weaving tapestries. So in 2009, UNESCO awarded Aubusson the title of Intangible Cultural Heritage and gave them some money to try and regenerate the industry and inject some new energy into the practice. So <coughs> they have actually set up a school and in the last three years I've seen um, 
the graduate work of the first group of 10 students, who, young people who have gone back to weaving and, um, and it's actually very heartening. Now, we have a guide when we are there called um, Suzanne Beret. I'll show you her in, in a minute. Um, she's just there on the left there out of the picture. So she comes with us and she translates. Um, and we actually set up really lovely dialogue with the weavers there because we're, they're, they're very interested in, in talking to people from the outside who know what they're doing. So this is Atelier A2, which is run by Franz Odile and um, Martin Stamm. And you can see that they get commissions and they interpret the work and Martin has that cartoon there on the left, which is why I included this, this slide, just gives you a little bit of an idea. So two-person workshop. And then um, this is Thierry Roger, who is a master dyer. He actually is the last dyer uh, left in Aubusson. The reason Aubusson was established is that there's a little tributary of the Cruz River that flows through the town. And uh, the, the actual, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, the pH of the, of the water was conducive to dyeing. So there were many dyes. And then the, the actual weaving industry grew and flourished from there. So this is Thierry in this tiny, absolutely pint-sized little dye shop. And he's raising and lowering the hanks of wool into a bath there on the left. And on the right, he's discussing with Suzanne um, a picture that has been sent, which is going to be woven into a tapestry. And he does this all by feel. So he can look at a colour and he can dye it. He adds a little pinch of this and a little pinch of that, and he gets it happening, which is quite remarkable. Um, on our first visit, we visited uh, the studio of Ben Alpha too, and uh, he was trying to teach me how <laughs> to weave on these horizontal looms uh, from the back. Um, and I can tell you, it's 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 very hard on the hands. There are foot pedals that lift the the walk, but it's uh, you actually your hands need to be incredibly strong to slide under those very very taut walks. This is a detail of one of the works that he had there. So you can see, very complex. Um, this is a, a, another weaver, um, and Francoise, and she was weaving a commission. Part of, part of what's happened in Aubusson uh, with this regeneration is that the Cité Internationale de la Tapisserie has taken over the museum and they have a design competition every year where they choose three usually enormous works to be woven for the for the collection. So it's all in this process of uh, revitalization. But this is uh, Francois uh, working on one of these uh, projects from the back and as you can see it's like a collection from the detail of, of pick-up sticks and if uh, any of the weavers here worked on the Leslie Dumbrell, they'll know how difficult it was to keep those lines going at the right angle. So she's doing it from the back. And, uh, and uh, you know, how she, get, how she kept track of it, I have no idea. And you can see her feet on the foot pedals on that detail on the right hand side. Another interesting project at the Atelier of Patrick Chio, also for the Cité. Uh, the design on the left-hand side, which is based on manga cartoons, this is a contemporary version of a unicorn, um, designed by Nicholas Booth, and designed as a floor piece. So over there you can see um, Patrick working on it, and you can see the design, you can see the complexity of the design. And in this slide, the following year, uh, we could see it in an exhibition 
uh, in the church in Felipton. And um, interestingly, they've combined the skills of the artisans of the area because they've got uh, the tapestry weavers who've woven the, the floor rug. And um, in um, Limoges, which is a town just down the road from Aubusson, the, that makes the famous uh, China that made the hoops and horns. The, the hoops and horns and head are made out of uh, Limoges porcelain. Um, on the right here, <coughs> there is, well, in fact, both these buildings belong to a woman called Chantal Chirac, uh, and she's a restorer of um, tapestry cartoons. So that was also very interesting, and uh, when we first went there, there was only the building on the left, which was her studio, and on the right, you know, she developed in the next couple of years a cartoon museum, which is also, you know, quite, quite fascinating. That's a, a shot of the interior of her studio. You can see a lot of them are sort of 18th century cartoons, uh, which she and restores and paints and actually sells to people. She's collected them from all, all over France and uh, is doing a great job. Um, this is uh, my friend Suzanne Beret in her textile conservation studio. She originally trained at Hampton Court, she's English. She married a Frenchman. She went to settle in France and she's got uh, a fantastic um, business that keeps her travelling all over France to restore textiles of all sorts. And here she's discussing with us a 19th century banner which uh, was used in street processions and because of this very heavy metalwork embroidery, uh, the silk that the banner was made of was starting to tear and she had to, to renovate this. Um, and here uh, examples, two, two other examples in two different years. The Lursa uh, tapestry on the left and a very, very, uh, and 16th century tapestry on the right, which is in very bad repair. But we do learn a lot about the conservation process as well, which is important. Now my last little sequence of slides is at the aforementioned Pantone Frere, who, the, the studio that, um, that wove the John Parker tapestry, uh, one of, also one of the oldest sort of uh, tapestry studios, and one of only two left in that area. And uh, for many years, they had actually had these commissions from uh, a London-based artist called Ahmed Mustafa, and you can see that his designs are based on um, Islamic calligraphy. So very, very complex. And the first time we were there, they had this lovely young woman who you can see there. She's the cartonnier. She's actually make. She's actually numbering the cartoon, which you can see here. The weavers at at. Um, Atelier Panton are artisan weavers. So it's all spelled out for them. So you can see all those, um, each, each uh, colour has a number. And here you can see it on the loom being woven. You can see the bundles and bundles of colours of bobbins. It's all very precise. And the final shot is of one of the actual ta tapestries being unrolled. So I just thought to end um, the whole, you can see the whole process there. Thank you very much.